We start with Isaac Svensson from the Department for Peace and Conflict Research, followed by Joel Alberg from the Volker Bernadotte Academy, then Yussi Oyala from Finn Church Aid, and at least, I must say, Jenny from the Life and Peace Institute. So dialogue is, is one of those crucial, um, crucial mechanisms of peace-promoting mechanisms that are utilized in many, many programs, peace-promoting programs worldwide. There are specific programs focusing on dialogue, and there are also, in many of the peace-promoting programs that we have, we have dialogue as one of the components of many uh, peace-promoting uh, programs. Uh, and the basic assumption and idea is that dialogue across uh, enemy lines, uh, for instance, in, in, in ethnic conflicts, across ethnic identities, will help to improve the, the positive attitudes of the other and in the long term change their behavior. And here, uh, Life and Peace and our department has a joint interest in trying to use the best methods that we can find to uh, try to see whether there is an effect uh, of dialogue. Now, up to, up to the study that we have made, uh, there have been uh, various studies on on, um, on dialogue, but they all uh, fail uh, in in sense that they cannot address these critiques. Now, our uh, solution to this is to do a randomized intervention, and we get the whole idea from how we they they do it in the medicines basically. So, you, what we have done is basically to do a similar kind of setup as in a medical trial. That is, you collect people that are interested to participate, you select them randomly, so you withdraw them by lot, and those that are selected are uh, then participating in the, uh, in the dialogue program. Uh, and after a year of participating in the dialogue program, we compare those that have participated with those that wanted to participate that, that did not participate. Uh, and we know because of the random selection that there are no other factors than the dialogue program. So this is the most solid research design that you can have that you can say something about causal effects. Uh, look at table uh, five here. Uh, and what you can see is clearly that, that uh, uh, for, uh, 67% of the participants are accommodative. Uh, and this is just one indicator. We can see across several indicators that it does have an effect on the attitudes in the sense that it reduces mistrust across ethnic groups. Thank you. A curse in uh, Iraqi history is that uh, all from the beginning Power has always come from outside. So even in the foundation of uh, Iraq in 1929, uh, it was founded by uh, Great Britain, and the first uh, ruler was brought from outside. And with the coup d'etat in 1968, with the Ba'athist uh, takeover, uh, power was uh, again uh, came from outside, and it was built on top of society. And one can wonder how can one build a, a dialogue or a process on anything. Uh, but we decided uh, that uh, the only thing we can do is offer the platform, offer the process. So we, we are not there to uh, solve uh, problems. Uh, and from that, uh, this was a, a very uh, good decision that we made. Uh, because that is the reason, in my analysis, all other countries uh, fail, really, or all other organizations because they sent professors, doctors, this and that, uh, who wanted to uh, uh, set uh, the audience right and to tell them uh, how the problem should be solved through expertise and through uh, experience and knowledge uh, acquired in our context. Uh, and uh, this is not uh, relevant. Uh, 
trustful relationship, uh, regardless where you live, what religion you have, who you are, man or woman, young or old, are a foundation of each society. Many problems, uh, conflicts has an element of trust. And that is the hardest thing to work. So uh, a lot of uh, uh, sessions, uh, they jump immediately to the subject matter, trying to solve a problem. But man, many times people just want to be listened to. They don't want someone to solve your problem. Thank you very much for your attention. That peace is not just the absence of, of war, but, but really it's the realization of, of human rights. Uh, and this is the way to to create peaceful societies, durable, sustainable peace. This kind of uh, bridge building still between the local mediation and international mediation, for example, which somewhat is the topic today, is, is very much needed. And this is also Finchurch AIDS um, experience. Having worked in Somalia for many years, since 2007, and with, you know, at the local level, really looking at the clan-based conflicts and mediation at the local level, which are the needs there, and trying to support the religious leaders and traditional leaders to, to push for peace, to mediate, uh, uh, act for reconciliation in their communities. Uh, very successfully, actually. Many conflicts, we can, we can, over a dozen conflicts, which we can record that uh, the elders have been uh, solving. But then the elders came to, to us and said that they want to be part of the they care for the whole of Somalia, not only uh, you know, their region uh, where they have been working, working um, for peace. And uh, this is how we began to, to advocate also vis-a-vis -vis the, the United Nations, that they should be hearing the, the messages from the field and seeing the value and the context of the, the, the local context in the national and international context. Uh, this discussion, the bridge was not there. It was only after our intervention uh, when, when the <coughs> Somali elders and UNPOS, the political office then a couple of years ago, met first time in, in 20 years. Uh, jumping, jumping ahead, we also then facilitated the contacts between the government and the elders. That's also a bridge that was, was missing. Religious leaders are an underused resource in mediation. LPI has such a good experience on, on working with the, the religious leaders also. So. We are happy to be partnering with LPI on, on many issues. Uh, we can see often in, in conflict situations that the dialogue in the on spot is not happening very well. You can have in the same city the relig religious leaders, the traditional leaders, and then a very fragile government, but they are not discussing with each other for power reasons or whatever ever reasons. And there's much room to, to facilitate this, this kind of dialogue or how the network practically works. Uh, the network gets assignments. If there's a hotspot, there's a conflict emerging or an emerging, or sorry, existing um, conflict which needs mediation, yet that the United Nations, for example, uh, needs information on the traditional structures, on the religious dynamics and actors, actors mapping, for example. This is something where the, the network can mobilize some of the network members. We have task forces on gender and radicalization. Those are the two ones which we really want to be focusing. We do trainings on, on many uh, um, local trainings, regional trainings, and then an annual global meeting and then, crucially, we have some small, modest funding to support local mediation initiatives. <laughs> LPI works with supporting local civil society organizations to become effective conflict transformers. And we work with, uh, in close partnership with a very limited number of partners to allow us to have a very close, close work. And one method we use is participatory action research. Uh, this presentation will look at how LPI uses participatory action research, or PAR, as we say. Uh, it's different phases and will consider some of its strengths and weaknesses. And speaking here, as we do in uh, Uppsala Castle, um, former home of Dag Hammarskjöld, of course, I've chosen DRC as the example, although we work also in Somalia, Sudan, Ethiopia, and so on. 
participatory action research uh, for concrete transformation is about letting the people, local people, design and dri driving the research process and, and dialogue, um, really putting the actors in the conflict and itself as at the forefront in, in, in driving the processes. We always need to start with a conflict or context analysis. Uh, and this is in order to start to understanding the multitude of several interactions of conflicts and different actors and stakeholders that are involved. Then we move to the phase of deep analysis and uh, of the priority conflict. Uh, and this involves collecting information from different parts of society, armed groups, women's groups, <coughs> community members, religious leaders, traditional leaders. Um, it's, it's, it's very focused and involves the grassroots, but also connects to, to the other tracks. Next phase is uh, feedback and validation. This is a very important part of the work to really validate uh, the issues that came up from the research to test and disseminate the findings to the community, but also feeding back with, with, uh, with new information and uh, coming back when, you, when you're uh, sharing this. Uh, this is also very important in creating confidence and trust with the communities and the participants. There might also be a need to work specifically with, with certain groups and have an intra-group dialogue. Uh, we work quite a lot on this in our case in southern South Kivu. Uh, and this was also important in building up for the next phase of the inter-community dialogue. So finally, uh, what we hope to get at, but... Uh, well, it's not sure that we do get there, but so far in all the process that we have been involved, uh, we always got there, but it has been close sometimes that we think, no, we will we'll never get there. But this is uh, an intercommunity dialogue where all the communities meet, and that takes us to, to the next phase, and maybe this is what, what really matters, um, to implement the actions identified and setting up mechanisms to do that. Um, and usually this involves uh, setting up conflict transformation platforms as a mechanism to implement the action plan. Uh, in, in our case in southern South Kivu, uh, we had four conflict <coughs> transformation that were, were set up and that since then have been working on implementing the things agreed in the action plan. Uh, they have also mitigated short-term violence and tensions that has occurred in the region. Thank you. A big thank, a big thank you to all four speakers. I would like to start with only a couple of thoughts, not too long, as an input for the four panelists to respond and also have the opportunity in the same order they were speaking, uh, to make a very short comment on the others and maybe uh, on the thoughts which I will raise now. Um, that brings me to the first uh, keyword which I picked up, uh, that was dialogue, uh, which relates to interaction. Uh, if it's done with the best of intentions, then it should end as a dialogue. That means an exchange between different parties who at least try to respect each other and the otherness in dialogue. That was the one keyword I picked up that came up in most of the presentations. The second one was power. Because even if we say we should enter in dialogue on equal terms, we should not pretend that there are no power structures at play. There are those who are included, there are those who are excluded, there are those among the included ones who have more power than the others, and we should not pretend that there is a level playing field. I think that's part of the rules of the game, not to pretend that we are all equal, because we are not. The third one is trust, because only, I believe, based on a dialogue which respects otherness and inequality, 
we are able to build up with a longer term perspective trusts. And it was another notion that came up all the time. That brings me to the fourth keyword, time, which Jenny at the end stressed so much that we also have to understand that these processes, these are processes, not one of things, require time. And she also added the word patience. We need time and we need patience. But I think we also need something else which was raised by Joel, very powerful at his end, and so much in contrast with the enthusiastic appraisal that Jussi started his presentation of on Swedish culture, that is integrity, meaning we should act as we preach. And that is not always the case. And that erodes and undermines credibility. But if we are engaged in conflict mediation in seeking to facilitate peace processes, we need to establish credibility. If that credibility is not there, we are doomed to fail. Because then we end up again in power struggles, trying to put ourselves through tricks into the superior position. So integrity and credibility, despite the fact that they were not mentioned, for me are interrelated to the other keywords. I should stop exactly there and invite the four speakers in the order they presented to share their thoughts and reflections over that initial round of presentations uh, within not more than three, four minutes, I would say, a maximum. So Isaac? So I want to pick up on, on one of those <coughs> things that you mentioned uh, uh, about in violent societies, how can they learn uh, to trust each other? And I think uh, this um, study that we have done actually shown that it, it is possible. So uh, uh, let me mention just a little bit about the background of, of, of the, the particular study that we did. This was done in Addis Ababa University, at the campus of Addis Ababa University. And this is a university campus that has been ridden by violent uh, riots and violence across ethnic groups. So it was a measurement both of uh, uh, trust in the sense that you trust the other side uh, and a measurement of trustworthiness, whether you sort of uh, reciprocated uh, in a trustful manner. Uh, and the surprising thing with, with that measure was that we could see no difference at all in the amount of money that was sent by those that had participated in the dialogue program and those that did not participate. So it seems that these dialogue programs have an effect on the attitude and level, but at least on this rough measure, and again, I want to stress that there are a lot of problems with that measurement, but at least through looking at this measurement, we can see that it does not influence the behavior. Um, those are a couple of uh, interesting points and uh, remarks uh, you mentioned, and I will uh, comment uh, schematically some of them. Uh, well, yes, uh, uh, in my own work as a practitioner, I s rarely use the word uh, dialogue any longer. I convened on conferences uh, and to working groups and sessions, etc. Because uh, I think uh, the word dialogue has uh, in a way been uh, misused and, uh, and it sort of implies that there are two equal parties who can get an equal stake into it. It has a locking uh, lock-in effect uh, of uh, parties. Uh, it tends to single uh, the uh, participants to two different groups. One is dialoguing with the other, uh, and that's not reality. I mean, there are many uh, things going on, and uh, how do you capture that? Uh, and it also tends to lock in uh, to a single question. I mean, look in uh, the Israel-Palestine issue. I mean, how can you expect a dialogue between those two? Everyone knows that uh, it's uh, Israel who caused uh, the uh, shots uh, and the outside powers. So uh, dialogue is not a meaningful word, in my opinion, in that uh, uh, sense. Thanks. Um, very quickly on this arms export and um, kind of being at the general level still. I, I think Sweden is in a position to 
respond to these wrongs in, in the world or its own doings in much better way than some other countries are. Um, if, if something something happens, I, I think you know certainly the the arms export is something that I would hope you know that there's enough momentum in Sweden. I would be surprised if there's not to counter that kind of political or economic interest which is is behind it. Um, for example, the the Syrian situation now. I, I was so impressed again to to read how Sweden is 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 allowing uh, the, the permanent asylum for so many uh, Syrian refugees and by far the, the largest uh, per capita um, what Sweden is accepting the, the refugees. Uh, you know, it would be a political suicide in Finland if the government would attempt anything similar. If Finland took 300 refugees extra, that's like a major thing and major resistance. And what's the figure in, in Sweden? thousands I I sorry I don't recall but it's it's just the right way to do and and even with regardless of the government I think there's such a good momentum to for this solidarity solidarity without borders okay um, the, the dialogue dialogue is something maybe I, I would like to discuss a few words um, in many contexts in the fragile states Somalia again being my mind uh, I think dialogue has much more meaning than in, in our societies. If you look at Somalia, it's really an oral society. You know, emails or newspapers or books don't count. It's really the encounter with the people. And then you really need to facilitate this, these meetings and the, the kind of dialogue that people are, are meeting. Now, whether you call it dialogue or, or meetings, I, I agree it's... Uh, it doesn't uh, matter. I, I would call it dialogue. Um, and then that the time factor. So we have brought together groups uh, uh, which actually we need and some individuals within the groups n know that they need dialogue. But we bring them together one week they spend saying that we're all brothers, we don't need discussions, it's all fine. The second week they began to emerge the uh, historical grievances, etc. Uh, which everybody knows, uh, and the third week they began to discuss the issues. So it's, it, it takes time, and three weeks is in the Somali context is very short. And the you know international donors, how to convince a three-week meeting, which actually should be a three-month meeting under a tree with full services, it's a, it can be quite expensive with 100 participants. Um, it, it's not Finnish way or Swedish way of doing issues, uh, but it, it may well be the Somali way. Uh, very quickly, still on, on other forms of dialogue, I, I would say, you know, I'm not academician, so I'm not talking on, on those terms, sorry about that, but this kind of vertical dialogue that I, I've been speaking, that kind of linking the local level with the United Nations or kind of international organizations, it's very much needed, or the local level grassroots and then the local governments uh, or national governments, that kind of dialogue, it's... It, there's such a huge need in many contexts for, for that kind of vertical dialogue. Also the horizontal dialogue that the people inside with the kind of same level are discussing and, and linked better uh, to share views. It's, it's something that um, we have learned to, to appreciate a lot. I think I, I stopped there. Thank you, Henning, for your very good words uh, that really comes out from the presentations. Uh, and I think all the words are, are quite interrelated. Trust, I think, takes time, and that's what we experienced in, in our PAR process, is that it takes time to establish trust and credibility working with these actors. Uh, also, gender and gender... Uh, uh, inclusion, of course, is, is a, a very important and challenging issue working, especially in states such as Somalia and, and, and DRC, very patriarchal. Um, also working with the participatory methods while trying to promote gender inclusivity uh, is, is something that we, we are 
constantly working to, with us as challenged, but to, to improve uh, with the uh, inter uh, the dialogue platforms that were set up at in this power process in 2012 uh, at the conflict transformation platforms we had 20% women as members. Uh, now in 2012 in in in, sim in the platforms the number of uh, women were 30%. So it's even though it's slow, it's been a gradual increase. And then of course it's not only about the numbers, but the participation, how much they contribute. But it's uh, speaking about power and, and, and that's something that I come to think about. To your question, if we make use of the UN conventions, um, yes, our gender policy that we work with in LPI, that we work in our, our work is uh, <coughs> influenced by 1325 and the, the different UN conventions. So, yes. Mm -hmm.